they made no pretense that they were trying to emulate the reggae stars or the reggae performers. They were white people playing reggae. Hence the, hence the title of the album, Regatta de Blanc, White Reggae. <laughs> The nice thing to remember is that Bob Marley liked what the police were doing, which is good. Uh, I mean, if he'd objected to it and hated what they were doing, that would have been a bad thing. By the time they'd finished touring the Regatta de Blanc album, they were firmly up there as the sort of, you know, probably the number one band in the world. You couldn't go past a newsstand without seeing Sting's face staring out from one teenage magazine or another. We were like hippies really, like, you know, what the hippies were supposed to be all about, sharing and loving and being together, one for all, all for one. It didn't last long because business got in, you know, but that's what I liked the most about those years. And with the police, it was that at the beginning. I mean, you, you know, like, you find three mates, two mates first and then three in another part of the world and, you know, it was just wonderful. The members of the police came from all sorts of different areas. Um, Stuart Copeland had played in a prog rock band, Curved Air. Um, that was, I think, his only musical experience before that. Sting had played in a jazz rock band called Last Exit up in Newcastle. The band had never, they were a local Newcastle jazz rock band. He'd never really been out of Newcastle before he came down to London at Stuart's behest. Um, Stuart had got him down because Stuart had seen him while Curved Air were on their last tour and he'd been impressed with Sting's playing and thought he could write songs. Um, at that time the, the guitarist who was the only true punk, it must be said, was one Henry Padovani. When I met Stuart, you know, uh, we went to jam with his, br his brother Ian was on bass and uh, Sonia Christina from Curve there was singing. So the, the four of us did a jam and uh, it was cool. Stuart's number, hey, look at that, I wrote that last night. It was called, it's called Fallout or whatever, you know, and so we played like that. And then Stuart says, hey man, that's great, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're going to stay in London, you know, asking me millions of questions. Who are you? Where are you coming from? From Corsica, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay? Stuart's like that, you know, full of questions and energy and enthusiasm. And I say, wow, you know, so you like rock and roll, you like Jimi Hendrix, oh, I love Jimi Hendrix, well, this is my idol, you know, what I want to do is I want to leave Curve there and put a, th a three-piece together. Oh, really, you have the people, not not yet, but, you know, why don't you come and keep jamming with me? You got to know something's happening in England, this is going to change everything. Oh, really? But it's not the Curve there music, this is finished, we can't make any money, we're about like eight people on stage, 15 people on the road, we're losing money at every gig, if we three-piece, we could make money. Let me show you, come with me, I'll take you to a club. And we open Melody Maker and you say, well look, Roxy Club, Tuesday, The Dam, fantastic, the best thing, let's go. 
and we all went there. You could see the way ahead was going to be simplicity and uh, image, a strong image. And uh, of course the other guys who later formed police with uh, Stuart, um, Sting, had image aplenty. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't uh, ask for a you know, more powerful uh, front man, really, because... Uh, and the other interesting aspect, really, musically speaking, was that Sting wasn't just a, a great good-looking singer. He had uh, great experience as a... Well, he was a bass guitar player, obviously, but he'd had a lot of jazz experience back home in Newcastle. And he was developing as a songwriter at the same time. So he had this kind of sophisticated approach to making music, which blended with Stuart's idea of having a lot of punk energy. How this was going to work, nobody quite knew, I don't think, at the time. Certainly from their first releases, uh, that once uh, they got together with Henry Padovani, their first guitar player, uh, their first, re uh, first singles that they put out very much reflected this kind of uh, Stuart's uh, ambition to create a really viable punk rock group. So it took a while for them to really evolve what everybody knew as the police sound, and, uh, but it was very quick, very fast as befitted the, the times, really. When we brought Andy into the band, we tried to play as a, we played as four pieces. He was not really any better, not at all. Andy was a great guitar player. He didn't bring anything to the band in terms of quality. Well, let's say, I mean, for the audience we were trying to reach, mind you, because an audience today would think we were better because a good player like Andy would bring something, of course. But at the time, he didn't bring anything to the to what we were trying to do. What he did bring was a different balance in the band because suddenly there was not Stuart and I and Sting with no word to say. There was Stuart and I and Andy and Sting. And that changed everything because Andy said, I like that song Sting and we should play. It was like, uh, wow, well, <laughs> suddenly democracy. And it was interesting, you know, because it was Stuart's band, but that's when he started to lose it a bit. Not lose it because he was the leader, but Sting got confident. There was a guy in the band who told him that he was writing great songs and basically says, yeah, I'll help you. And suddenly I had an interest in them. He said, That's a great chord, very complicated. I know how to do it. Look at that. He was like, wow, I want to work with you. So they started to work together. And that's where it became different. And that's when, as far as we were concerned, that band, we wouldn't last. So that's when I was, you know, at the end of... And then we'll talk about it. I've done a few a few months. I was not part of that band, and they continued as a three piece. Between them, they evolved this extraordinary new sound, and uh, as they made the jump from punk into reggae, uh, it freed up Andy in a way. His his uh, chords uh, delighted Sting. I think he really liked the way he played on tracks like Roxanne. and so uh, it was a perfect match, really. Whether they argued or not, it didn't really matter. Uh, you know, as personalities and as musicians, so it was a very, it was rather like Cream, I suppose, the other great trio, um, and the Jimi Hendrix experience. I think they were the, the continuation of that kind of tradition. Came up with a sort of very something very fresh and new, and it's hard to actually sort of pin it down to because it was reggae influenced, but it wasn't obviously reggae. It was pop, but it was not straight ahead sort of pop. It was rock, but without kind of you know crashing big flashy metal guitars or anything. Um, so musically, it was yeah, it was kind of sort of somewhere in the middle of reggae rock. Again, a little bit of new wave sort of elements and post punk sort of attitude.
Well, the police at the time in, let's say, at the end of 77 and 78 were not a band for an audience that existed in London. They were experimenting with reggae, with different kind of attitude, plus again in London, maybe unfortunately, it was unfair, but people knew that suddenly with the band that was left was Stuart from Curve there, Sting from Last Exist, jazz rock band from Newcastle, and Andy Summers, older than anybody in town, who had played with Kevin Nyers and all those guys. How uncool do you want to be? Well, in the eyes of the enemy, it was the worst band in, in England. You know, ev nobody liked the police. Because it's always a struggle to launch a new band in London. There's this kind of built-in sort of ho-hum, we've seen it all before, <laughs> attitude. That even groups like Led Zeppelin were bashing their heads against the wall when they started 10 years earlier. And I think probably the police felt the same thing. They'd be playing um, uh, small clubs like the Marquee and, you know, going around playing for students and hoping to get recognized and getting press uh, coverage. But in America, uh, they came without any sort of baggage. People didn't really know who they were. They just heard the music and they saw the people. That's when Miles Copeland comes in. But he was just the last guy that kind of, at least you can help. If you're not going to manage us, help us. Because nobody wants to. Miles came in, listened to the songs and said, this is crap as well. He said, guys, but what did you change that? You should have had Henry in there, blah, blah, blah. And you know, all the band was like, just like so depressed, thinking that's it, the band's splitting now. This is it. After this, we lost money, we wasted all these things, we're gonna become session players. So the engineer put a tape on, and um, the song that came in the studio was Roxanne. So, you know, Sting was probably thinking, this is it, they're gonna tell me I just like got it wrong once more, you know. You know, and Miles listened to the song and said, well, I like that. Do you have any more like that? That kind of reggae feel is cool. It's very interesting. He says, well, you know, Sting says it's got plenty, but, and Stu's like, and Miles says, look, I love this shit. I'm going to go to a record company and get you a deal. He was like, wow. So suddenly, somebody got interested. Miles took a cassette, went to A&M, and A&M refused. The thing is, like, people have to know. And Miles says, look, you've got to give me a deal. And he said, but we don't like this. And Miles insisted and insisted and insisted. And a and signed the band, recorded Roxanne, put it out of the single, and he flopped. And Miles says, look, guys, I still think it's great. We, I got another idea. We're going to go to America. Roxanne as a hit single in both England and America is really quite convoluted. It actually took off first in America and that's because they, they went over and played a tour there. Um, Stuart's brother Ian, Ian Copeland, had an agency there and he brought them over um, and packed them into a car. Three of them could get into a car, put the drums in the back, put the guitar across the back seat where the other two of them were, and he fixed up a tour for them at various clubs around the northeast coast of America. In America, something happened. Uh, a radio picked up the song, and the people liked that band. You know, they went there to see those big, mean punks, and this was something that could play. They saw a band that could play, and they say, we like punk music, we like punk rock. They saw the police was a punk rock band. And suddenly they gave them room in America. They say, oh wow, they have blonde hair. They look a bit like, you know, maybe are they gay? God knows what they are. You know, they're kind of like, you know, conservative America kind of looked at them and saying, whoa, shocking, but good. And when they came back into England, AM re released the record. And then it was.
It's one of those wonderful songs that just pop up out of nowhere, although in this case uh, Sting was inspired by a trip to Paris. Uh, they went, the police went to France to play a gig where there was uh, nobody there, so it was all rather depressing. And I think Sting went for a walk around the streets of Paris and encountered the red light district. And, uh, and he saw the beautiful girls lined up waiting for uh, work and clients, and this inspired him to write the song. It's so full of little commercial hooks, like, you know, virtually every line in the verse is a hook in itself, um, which is pretty clever songwriting. I think that the, uh, the actual uh, the pitch at which Sting was singing um, it was so high that it, you, it, his voice stood out. You know, you don't even need to hear really like one or two words of Roxanne on the radio, and you're immediately aware, oh, it's that guy, you know, weird-looking guy, very good-looking guy with blonde hair. I just think it's a seriously killer tune, you know, and it packs a lot of punch and it it gets a lot said in you know in the first sort of minute and a half. Um, and I think the groove is fantastic. Um, and it's the fact that it's kind of this sort of this tension that builds up because the drums don't really do that much. Um, and then when it gets to that killer sort of hook, you know, red light hook, it's suddenly the drums come pounding in. It's suddenly it's not reggae at all, it's sort of full on rock and roll and it's like kind of gets quite sort of thrashy and Stuart Copeland starts kind of beating shit out of the kit. It was unlike anything that people had heard before. Yes there were elements of reggae in it, there were elements of punk in it and that staccato beat. Um, it was just unusual and, and it stuck in the brain. That was the other thing about it. It stuck in the brain and you could, you could hum it. There weren't too many punk songs at that point that you could hum. Well, of course, Outlandos d'Amour, which was their debut album, uh, presented the whole package. You saw on the cover these memorable... Uh, uh, pictures of the three blonde young guys. I think they'd actually dyed their hair, hadn't they? <laughs> Apart from Stuart, who was a natural blonde, I think Sting and Andy had to dye their hair blonde. So there's a lot of excitement about the band, and they had the right uh, credentials and the right roots. You know, they came, although they were uh, <laughs> posing as a punk rock band initially, I think people realised very quickly that they were rather more than your average uh, punk rockers. They had a lot to say and a lot to, to sing about and perform. I had a much raw edge, you know, I think with, you can see in this sort of pieces sort of discography, with each album, Sting, in particular as a writer, got more and more ambitious. Um, some might say that sort of towards the end he'd got maybe too wordy and sort of, you know, sort of, sort of hadn't quite gone to like sort of writing songs, including lines about Kafka and stuff like that, but he was sort of headed that way, um, you know, it wasn't. But Atlantis de Moor was very much a traditional classic to me, sort of classic rock pop album. It was very much a, a fashionable punk album, um, recorded on a shoestring, £2,000 I think, if that, at Surrey Sound Studios, and they were Sting songs by and large, um, given that furious punk energy. And it was very clipped, very tight, um, no frills, well no budget. <laughs> Um, but it did contain two songs that um, clearly marked the future for the police. One was Roxanne and the other was Can't Stand Losing You.
I can't stand losing you is, is in many ways, I suppose you could call it the perfect pop song because uh, although it has a lot of powerful energy and uh, but it's um I think people like the the fact that it's almost like a suicide note in a way. <laughs> it's got that kind of uh, attacking sort of uh, dramatic. I mean, uh, I think probably Sting's acting ambitions and roots can come out in a lot of his lyrics. So when he's writing, it's almost as if he's writing dialogue and perhaps a sketch or a play. I mean, he's addressing his remarks to to somebody in particular, so you get that personal contact. It was very smart for the time that it came out, and I think this is the other point about the police is that they they hit the zeitgeist in that manner. That that there was the energy of punk roaring everywhere. What the police did was to make songs out of it. It marries um, rock, pop, and kind of quasi reggae. Um, and it follows the sort of the same patterns and the same sort of uh, template blueprint as a lot of other Peace songs. But I think that was the first one where Sting probably wrote it and knew that he'd written a very, very big hit. It's a new way of doing things. Although, of course, they did take from reggae, um, which was a cool thing to do because Bob Marley was very popular as well. So it was a, a very uh, clever and interesting take on uh, these two aspects of punk and reggae. And they came up with something very original and fresh. Both those singles were re-released several times. And each time they would bubble up, almost get there, and then go away, and then finally both of them did get there. It was a sort of, it wasn't a war of attrition so much, but I think that the record company, and indeed everyone around the band, had enormous faith in those t two songs, that actually they would do it in the end, and they did. <laughs> The way they approached album making was, um, well, could be quite difficult. I mean, they used to complain bitterly about um, having tremendous pressure in the studio. If if only if Sting only turned up with one song, and they had an album to make, uh, it would be a lot of pressure on Andy and Stuart. And Stuart's songs, to be uh, fair, weren't that great. Most bands have their first album; it, it's all inside them. It, it just pours out. When it comes to the second album, um, if, particularly if the first one's been relatively successful, it's hard. They've been on the road promoting the first album. They really haven't had time to write all the songs for the second album. And it was much the same with The Police. They had about half the album, two-thirds of the album, but there were still gaps. I think at one point they even sort of re-recording their very first single, Fallout. With the regatta of the Blanc album, um, A, you've got a very, very confident band because they knew that not all the people had sort of bought the first album and, and liked the band and it was very exciting and fresh. So I think the songs were written with a lot more confidence because they knew that the chances are millions of people would go out and buy this album. Just a cast away, an island lost at sea, Message in a Bottle um, had come, was one of the songs that they did already have. It was a riff that Sting had had for several months, actually quite soon after the first album. 
and he'd been toying around with it and it's one of those things that just developed over the course of months. The riff got turned inside out, little bits got added, taken away, um, until finally there was a structure of the song. But I, actually, I think what makes that song is Stuart's drumming. Stuart's drumming on that song is phenomenal. Um, and it really sets the tone for the whole thing. This is where he developed his own style, using the bat end of the stick, uh, tapping on the rim shot, so you get that kind of random uh, percussive effect, which nobody else had been doing really, except in the jazz world. Uh, people like Art Blake had used that technique as an offbeat mainly. Uh, but here was Stuart, um, I suppose he probably got some of his ideas from the, the reggae drums with Bob Marley, but with the extra echo effect and the, the kind of upfront way his drums were recorded, uh, this, this little percussive technique of his was really important in uh, establishing the whole new police sound. started getting reggae rhythms together. Stuart's drumming really responded to that. And in fact, the rest of the band, the other two in the band, um, definitely preferred Stuart playing reggae to playing punk. Um, Stuart's problem when he played straight ahead punk songs that he, was that he would always speed up. Um, and that infuriated the others, that he would get faster and faster. With reggae, it kind of tied him to a feel. Um, and that, that's how that, that whole field developed there. Stuart's playing a sort of an interesting reggae rock. Stuart loved Cotopas playing, by the way, you know, he was really into that. Stuart loved Fleetwood Mac, uh, sort of Mike Fleetwood's playing, because it's sort of like, there's a sort of um, build up and vibe and all that. And, uh, and okay, okay, if he wasn't for Sting, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have never played reggae, really. Together with Andy's very spare chords and um, Sting's vocals, you've got this this kind of uh, electrifying effect which uh, uh, makes every track not just a, a sort of thunderous pop performance but uh, a kind of uh, <clears throat> almost you get the feeling that they're improvising while they're recording the track. It's got everything really. Um, it's got the instantaneous sort of pop hit factor. Um, again, it's a bit like Can't Stand Losing You, you know. Um, he sort of, you know, the, 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 when it gets to the chorus, uh, it, it teases you. It's the sort of thing, the sort of song everybody would say, well, I wish I could think of that. I wish I thought of that idea about loneliness uh, being encapsulated in the idea of putting a message in the bottle and throwing it in the sea and wondering if anybody would ever find your, your heartfelt uh, greetings and uh, uh, you know the idea of a, a bottle floating around the world and then eventually turning up and suddenly finding it and making contact with the sender maybe 20 years in ahead it does happen so it's a rather neat and nice idea for a song a lyric and uh, and the way they performed it as well was, um, I mean, it was beautifully done in a typical police fashion. I think at the end of the day, it's a great melody, you know, it's, and combined with Sting's voice, it's just got, you know, it's just got everything. The interesting thing about Sting's vocals, of course, is that very high-pitched kind of um, feminine vocal style that he employed a lot with the police. Uh, apparently quite a lot of that was influenced by Cleo Lane, the famed jazz singer who was married to John Dankworth. So in his early days, I think Cleo Lane, interestingly, was, was quite an influence on Sting's vocal style. The Stuart had lent himself Bob, Bob Marley's record and he was starting to sing like Bob Marley, you know, like with that voice, that vocal voice, and playing bass like a reggae guy. I never had that before. Dreaming dreams are what you 
I think it's fair to say that Sting is a very underrated bass player. Um, you know, when people speak of the police, we sort of talk about the wonderful collection of songs, you know, the, the great marriage between the bass player and the, the drumming and the guitar playing. But um, he was a very unselfish bass player. And in a lot of the songs, you take the bass away. And, and in fact, that's one of the cornerstones of the police's sound. Sting is perhaps, as far as I know, the guy who sings the best that I know, in the sense that he will need, he will hit perfect note all the time. And he's playing the bass, which is very difficult, but probably the bass gives him a very interesting sense of harmony, you know? And Sting plays the bass more as an harmony instrument, I think, you know? It's, uh, no, the guy is extremely talented. He understands harmony so well. The bed's too big without you. As a stage number, it allowed them to stretch out in a way that, that some of the other songs didn't, that they were very, some of the other songs were very tightly structured and there wasn't a great deal of room for movement. Uh, the bed's too big without you could expand and it was a very definite, that, that was probably the strongest reggae rhythm um, in, on the whole album. This reggae thing, this Bob Marley thing, this, this record that Stuart gave him, help him in a direction but eventually he showed that he can write in all kind of styles i mean and you know and sting sting is a musician songwriter this is what sting is about he couldn't have written those songs i think without having been in the piece in the band it was you know the, the groove of the band um and the sort of you know the the, the sort of tight it, the, the tightness they, you know, they worked very hard and they rehearse a lot and they were a very tight band um so I think his songs wouldn't have been born, you know, some of the classic sort of police songs, without Andy Summers and Stuart Copeland's input in terms of musicians as, as band members. They really needed Sting to deliver the, the hits, so uh, I think album making for them could be quite tough in the studio. Long hours of frustration and argument sometimes about whether a piece worked or not. But when it did come together, it was it was magical. It was great. They were, I think they're they're best when they were playing as simply and as dynamically as possible. Uh, you know, when they went into overdrive on some of the the great riff tunes, uh, that was the police at their best. The whole of the album. Everything could have been a single, especially after you know "Message in a Bottle" had been sort of proved so successful. Um, you know, the world, the musical world, was 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 just totally you know at the feet of the police. They were like sort of probably the most happening band in the world because they were exciting. They were a live rock band, so they weren't just a pop act that you could sort of enjoy their songs on the radio. They were out there already starting to do kind of you know arenas and up. Um, and they weren't quite doing stadiums at that point, but. You know, they had a very big audience. So I think um, it's a very clever record. And um, I think the single sort of unfolded, you know, they, 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 they showed themselves.
I'm not sure how clever Sting's lyrics are for Walking on the Moon, because I think it started off with walking, as walking around the room <laughs> while he was drunk one evening and then really developed after that. Simplicity really is, I think, the keynote of this, this particular track because uh, it starts in a very sort of dramatic sort of way with Stuart's drums tapping away in the background and this great chord, this big spatial chord from Andy Summers. And uh, certainly Sting later said that that was one of the, uh, the highlights of the most important facets of, of Walking on the Moon was, was Andy Summers' great big power chord in the middle, a ringing chord. And uh, I suppose the drums, in a way, sort of uh, typify or symbolise the sound of somebody walking on the moon in space. There's a lot of space in the whole piece. It's uh, big black holes, I think Sting once described it. So, uh, yeah, you, you almost feel like you are bouncing on the surface of the moon when you listen to it. The other good song off the album, I always think, is Death Wish, um, which has got, which is a kind of almost metallic reggae sound to it, a very harsh sound with Andy Summers um, making a very, using um, very clipped guitar sounds to drive the rhythm along. And there's two different rhythms. The, the, there's the basic rhythm that holds it along, then occasionally it breaks into a a slightly more staccato rhythm that rolls around a bit. And he was just a little guy, but he had tremendous ideas. He was a very big-hearted sort of person as well, who I knew very well from his days with Zoot Money's big roll band, of course, and Dan Talion's Chariot, Kevin Coyne. And I remember meeting Andy in the marquee again, uh, just before he joined the police, and he was very excited about this opportunity of playing with his new band, with Stuart and uh, Sting. And the end of the day, one played reggae and the other, the other one kind of rock reggae drumming, but Andy, nobody played guitar like that before. Because, you know, he was, he was very technical and he's an incredibly good guitar player. I mean, that's why he was doing sessions. I mean, he was playing blues with Alexis Corner, he was playing jazz with Kevin Nyers. I mean, he was like, the guy he was like, oh, he could play. And he was interested at the time in FX and all this echo and uh, these uh, flanges and all these effects that he, he, he put in. And he only put them in because he was an older player. His own talent flowered and blossomed with the, with the police because he'd had all these years of experience. He'd been playing since he was 17 back in the 60s. R&B and jazz and uh, not really a heavy rock guitar player. He was never in the, or blues guitar player. He was never like Eric Clapton or Jeff Beck. He always was a more of a chords man. He loved coming up with interesting inversions and interesting jazz chords. And of course that was perfect uh, with Sting's interest in jazz and, and Stuart's sophisticated kind of drumming. The turning point, point for the police in terms of popularity came in England uh, towards the end of 1979 um, when first Message in a Bottle and then Walking on the Moon hit the charts. The band were on top of the pops and suddenly they had a new audience. They had a teenage audience that was screaming at them. And this was something they hadn't encountered before. 
And it was Sting who rose to the occasion and focused his attention on that audience. He knew how to use a camera. And it was around that time you couldn't go past a newsstand without seeing Sting's face staring out from one teenage magazine or another. And that was really where the police began to take off. This is the band that now had Message in a Bottle and Walking on the Moon, blasting out from the airways every day. And they were a hugely successful band very quickly. The strong points of Regatta de Blanc are that it really introduces the police sound. It, 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 it confirms the police sound, it takes it, it moves on from the first album, it slaps the police style down clearly on about five or six tracks. The weak point of the album is that it should have done it, it should have been more coherent as an album. Um, with, with more time, probably not a great deal more money necessarily, but with a bit more time and a bit more thought, it could have been um, a better rounded album, it, it, would have had, it would have been more cohesive. But having said that, it did the job perfectly. By the time they'd finished touring the Regatta de Blanc album, they were firmly up there as the sort of, you know, probably the number one band in the world. Um, I think that the Zenyatta and Mondetta album did then further cement them in terms of as a stadium act, you know, I think they sort of started flying around their own jets and they were just doing stadiums, they wouldn't, you know, literally, there was no point in trying to do an arena or play to like 10, 12,000 people. Zenyatta Mondata was the police's third album and uh, it was a big success. It was uh, a number one uh, platinum album, of course, but the actual writing of it and the recording apparently were quite difficult for the group. In fact, they were working on it right up to four o'clock in the morning on the day before they were about to go off on a huge world tour. And Stuart later said that it was really hard work uh, just getting the whole thing together. I don't think that the uh, Zenyatta Mondata album it's a great album, but um, I think that on this album we hear um, a band that have become ludicrously successful worldwide and enjoying the, all the accolade, enjoying you know the position, sort of basically the number one band in the world. Um, to top Regatta de Blanc would have been a, a, a serious feat, and I don't think it's, it tops that album. Uh, the Zenyatta album, but it's pretty damn good, and it's um, it's still got those very infectious, catchy sort of hits on it. Personally, for me, I find Regatta de Blanc is a better album than Zenyatta Mondata because the good songs are so good uh, and they're so, they're so raw and powerful. They, it's, it's sort of the police naked, if you like. It, it's finding their style and it's in the first flush of it. It doesn't quite have the depth, I think, of Regatta de Blanc. You know, Regatta de Blanc 
in that it's got all the big sort of kind of pop hits. It's also got a lot of depth about it, and it's um, it's a pretty serious body of work. Um, to me, Zenyatta, much as I like some of the material on it, it's it's um, I know that there was already kind of you know cracks starting to appear in the band. I think people thought it would go on forever, and that they would go on making more and more brilliant albums, but. Of course, they, they couldn't do that. No, nobody can be uh, that creative in that kind of environment all the time. And I think we saw with the third album, it was becoming hard work for them. Unless Sting was in the right frame of mind and came up with another Roxanne or Walking on the Moon, uh, then it kind of fell apart, really, because what, what you were left with was uh, three very good jamming musicians, uh, but they needed those songs to jam with, and maybe Sting himself felt later that maybe... Uh, he could do uh, songwriting with uh, in a different way, where he wasn't up against, uh, you know, feeding the machine. Really, mm. I think he, that was probably uh, sowing the seeds for the eventual demise of the band. A band is just this normal thing, you know. Every band's the same. You don't know the end of the story. You just got to leave it to the fool. It's easy to tell the story afterwards. I guess it's Sting who said that bands are like marriages without sex, but you have this very, very, very close relationship. I'd say more like family, like brother things, you know, it's very, very, very close. Translation of Regatta de Blanc is white reggae, um, and you know we touched on earlier on about sort of talking about the police, the reggae influence in there. So I think they were kind of in a very light-hearted way acknowledging their their sort of influence and their debt to say Bob Marley and the Wailers uh, to, to bring in this reggae influence into the world of rock and pop. They were rock musicians, and they were using reggae for their own ends to produce something else. It made a particular form of reggae, and it was what everybody else, they could see the reggae ele element in it. Um, but in fact, it, it, it was different in, in the way that it happened, and that's what gave them their unique slant. Just to cast away, an island lost at sea, oh, and Not many bands can come up with an album like that. It's uh, probably most great groups usually manage to produce one good album in their career, whereas the Police, I think, produce certainly three great albums, and Regatta de Bonk is definitely one of them.